The topics and opinions expressed on the following show are solely those of the hosts and their guests and not those of W4WN Radio, its employees, or affiliates. We make no recommendations or endorsements for radio show programs, services, or products mentioned on air or on our web. No liability, explicit or implied, shall be extended to W4WN Radio, its employees, or affiliates. Any questions or comments should be directed to those show hosts. Thank you for choosing W4WN Radio. This is Beyond Confidence with your host, Divya Park. Do you want to live a more fulfilling life? Do you want to live your legacy and achieve your personal, professional, and financial goals? Well, coming up on Divya Park's Beyond Confidence, you will hear real stories of leaders, entrepreneurs, and achievers who have stepped into discomfort, shattered their status quo, and are living the life they want. You will learn how relationships are the key to achieving your aspirations and financial goals. Moving your career or business forward does not have to happen at the expense of your personal or family life, or vice versa. Learn more at www.diviapark.com and you can connect with Divya at contact at diviapark.com. This is Beyond Confidence, and now here's your host, Divya Park. There's one of my most favorite times to be here with you, and I'm so thrilled and excited. It's Monday evening, and we have a very different type of guest today, and I want to share something very exciting. So as you all know, with a book in my background, Expert to Influencer, we have been taking the profits from my book and you have made it possible because you have bought quite a bit of, quite a few copies and also reached out to me and shared that you really enjoyed it and it has made a big difference in your life. So I'm thrilled to share that we were able to help two additional entrepreneurs through Kiva.org. So if you have not got your copy, get your copy today and i want to share with you today we have a guest a special guest and her name is aita lysendring she's a graduate of brown university and she spent three years as an editor at l magazine representing the magazine at industry events worldwide and writing monthly features she graduated then from honors of Benjamin Cardozo School of Law in 2006. She was recognized for excellence in service to the law school for her clinical work in criminal defense. And she has been representing defendants as a staff fraternity with the New York City Legal Aid Society in Brooklyn. And there she has successfully represented thousands of clients charged with crimes and in the last five years she has coached high profile trials resulting in acquittals in both state and federal courts she has also appeared on dateline 48 hours and has been selected as a new york metro rising star by super lawyers in 24 2016. welcome Aida, cannot hear you. You might want to check and unmute yourself. Hmm, we still, I still can't hear you. Can you hear me? Hey, Rebel. Hi. Can you hear? I cannot hear Ida. I cannot hear her either. Huh, we were able to hear her right before the show. Maybe should she log back in? I'm not exactly sure why it's happening this way. Do you want to, do you want to, uh, let me call her since I have her number. Can you hear us? So she can hear us. Okay. I'm going to call her to log out and come back in again. She can hear us. So you can just tell her. Oh, okay. Can you log out? Oh, she there she goes. 
<laughs> and while we wait for her to come back to the studio, why don't you tell everybody a little bit more about your book and where to get it? Yes, folks. So my book is for anyone who is hungry to make an impact, somebody who is ready to take charge. And now is the time. Because let me tell you, the worst times are the best times. And why the worst times are the best times? Because think about it, 95% of the population is, or 90%, I don't know the exact percentage folks, but most of the people are thinking, oh my goodness, COVID-19, I cannot do anything. This is getting to me. This is the time to show up as leader. And how do you show up as a leader? That's what I share with you in this book. Especially, it doesn't matter if you're a professional. It doesn't matter if you're a CEO of the company. It doesn't matter if you're an entrepreneur or what matters is your hunger. If you have a calling, if you sincerely feel that, yes, I'm here to do more, be more, and if you're meant for more, you're just not here to live and just pass through the life, you're here to make an impact. If you are somebody who is ready to do that, get the book and it is available on Amazon, as long as you like type in expert to influencer, you'll be able to find it and just type in my name. And actually what I could do is that even pull it up and share it in the chat. And should I call Aida? Because she really has a wonderful story to share. I and folks, this is what happens, right? Like we are here in a, on a live show and things happen. Technology happens like we tested, we checked and her sound system was working. And that's all right. Things happen. We take things in stride and keep on moving forward, folks. That's what needs to happen. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to call our guest. I'm going to mute myself. Can she call from her phone? Do you think can she log in from there? Would that be okay? She, she could use the same login that you gave her, but as far as calling, since we're on television, no, it doesn't. We can't just call. Okay, got but it. But she can log in on her phone if she wants to try a different device other than what she was using. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we're on television talk right now. Divi is what you see. We'll give you a uh, playback here. What you're seeing is Divya calling the guest to get her back into the studio. We didn't want to have dead air. So just going to give you a little commentary here. Wish I had some music to play for you. But unfortunately, we don't have music right now. Look, looks like Divya is going to be back with us. Hi, Divya. Yes. So, folks, I talked with our guest and she's going to try to use another device. And until then, you and I can have a conversation. So I want to share something very interesting that happened recently. So today I was just walking down the street for my walk. And as I was walking down, there were a couple of kids playing around and they were wearing masks, which I was really surprised. They were in, in the driveway. And what's interesting was that even though they were wearing masks, it doesn't mean that you lose connection. And they were waving at me. I waved back and I said, good morning. And they both said, good morning. I think so one was a boy, one was a girl, probably one was five years old, one seven, eight years old. And we had a conversation. I kept my distance and they were both so adorable, really, really adorable. So what that tells us is that even though there is distancing right now, but the time is where we can connect so much more together with each other just because we don't have the inhuman connection doesn't mean that we have gone far away we can make an effort and connect ah i see ida is back welcome ida 
Thank you so much. I don't know if anyone heard me thanking you for having me on this show. I'm very excited to be here. And my apologies. I thought I was ready to go. I nailed it the first time and then there was some disconnect. Ina, let me tell you, you know, technology happens all the time. And this is what teaches us how to be in the real world. So let me ask you one of our favorite questions is that when you were a child, do you have any moments that you remember that shapes you to be the woman that you are today? Yes, I actually, um, so I was born in Spain and I didn't come to the United States until I was six years old. Mm -hmm. And what, you know, I came from a family in Spain where my mother hadn't graduated from high school. She had me when she was very young. My grandmother, literally on my mother's side, learned how to read and write when she was 55 years old. Her husband died. She worked in a factory. So she was a very hardworking woman. And my mom met my dad. She remarried. And my father adopted me and brought me over to the United States. And so all of a sudden, my world was incredibly different. There were more buildings. They were taller. I came from this tiny little town next to a mountain. And I um, ended up meeting my father's sister, Erica. And mm -hmm. I just remember looking up at her and thinking, wow, she's this beautiful, stunning, um, very straightforward but kind woman. And she's a lawyer and she's litigated death penalty cases. And I remember being so impressed and thinking that was kind of, you know, so intangible and, and hard to achieve, but it gave me an idea and an image of what I could become. Mm -hmm. So first of all, I would like to give kudos to your grandma who learned to read and write at 55. And that tells us that it's never too late for anything. And I sincerely believe in that. And Really, kudos to your mom for bringing you and raising you to be such a wonderful person where you have taken on a cause. And it's amazing how people can leave a mark upon us. And which shows that, you know, it's so important to give good exposure to your kids where you have role models. So that said, as you grew up, where were your thoughts when you were in high school, did you want to like still become a lawyer? Because from what to be read your bio, it seems like you're an editor first. Oh, absolutely. I had no idea what I wanted to be. I thought I wanted to be a writer. Um, I, you know, loved, I actually really loved high school. I went to boarding school. So I lived and ate and played sports and was taught with all my friends. And everybody came from such a diverse background. And I knew I wanted to be the best that I could possibly be, but I had no idea. I thought I wanted to be a filmmaker. I took a lot of film courses. And I think that's a very healthy attitude. Some people know and they become who they've always wanted to be. And I just keep going down these little paths and turns and I go up the stairs and I take a left then I go up an elevator. I, I still to this day don't know where I'll be in 10 years. Well, I love the idea that you are keeping an open window. And when your mind is facing an open window, not only you're growing, you are able to bring freshness to your life. And it's totally okay. It's possible that who you were 10 years back, who you are today 10 years, and you may be a different person. I come from a very, very big background. I come from biochemistry, neuroscience, and biopharmaceuticals. And even in biopharmaceuticals, I did so many different things that it's good to be open. So as you moved forward, what was your basic degree initially? What was my, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. What was your like uh, initial degree? My initial degree is, um, you know, I actually, I, I got published in a magazine when I was a senior in high school and I had done little movies and then I went off to college and I, did a double major at Brown in um, um, American literature and also Hispanic literature and culture. So I read a lot and I wrote a lot. Um, and I figured that could be useful at some point in my life. And it definitely was. Um, but even after I graduated from Brown, I, I really had 
no idea. I didn't have this tangible sense of what I wanted to do. I really wanted to write, but I thought I don't quite have the life experience yet. I think I need to live mm -hmm. and then figure that out, which is probably how I ended up becoming a, an editor because I got to have a stable salary and job, which my father always impressed upon me um, is, you know, the most important um, thing you can do, just work, 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 work. Um, so I got a job and then I ended up not doing the kind of creative writing that I would have um, thought about, um, but definitely learned the business of the magazine industry. And it was to some extent very creative. Mm -hmm. And the magazine industry is so different. I mean, Elle is uh, one of the leading magazines. So to land an editor's job, it's uh, very impressive. Um, it's funny because you you look at the movie, The Devil Wears Prada, and you, you look at all the fashion and <laughs> the intensity of it. And that was definitely an aspect and it was present. But I think what's shocking is I'm a lawyer now and I go into courtrooms and, um, you know, I'll, I'll try a murder case or um, a very serious violent felony. And yet... Mm -hmm my indoctrination into the world through Elle magazine was the most intimidating experience ever because there are all these overqualified women that graduated from Yale and Harvard and they're very serious about the product they're putting out there the deadlines the integrity of their stories the fact checking and you know i was i was new and sort of an underling and i remember looking at the editor in chief Robbie Myers and she was um intimidating she was very together she's very intelligent she demanded perfection but she also gave people great opportunities and didn't just pander to the advertisers so i definitely learned a tremendous amount there and i got some free shoes and makeup too so that was <laughs> an added bonus absolutely and so many times what happens is people think that oh if i'm going to change my career it's going to be devastating. I cannot take my skills and transfer it to another thing that I'm doing. And there's one of the questions, you know, that goes refers back to your grandma is that can we really learn anything at the late stage? And that applies, you know, I'm, I'm an advocate of going for your dreams doesn't matter what age it is. So, I think so. How, how would you respond to that question? I mean, the, the answer is, Absolutely. Um, I think it's easier said than done. And when you're thinking about it, it can be a daunting endeavor. Um, right now, I've been practicing law for uh, 14 years. And I think to myself, what would I do if not this? But you have to remind yourself that you've accumulated all this experience and all these areas of expertise. And you've also been networking, right? So mm -hmm. at some point, I... Um, I love being a defense attorney and I love what I do. And, um, but at some point I didn't feel creatively inspired anymore. So I was sitting in a nice restaurant with my mother and brother enjoying a very delicious glass of red wine. And I said, you know, I wish I could work on death penalty cases. I would love to do a TV show um, that cast a light on, you know, people on death row and what that experience is really like for them and their families and humanize them. And my mom and brother encouraged me and I sent a text some chilly October in Spain to my wonderful friend um, and mentor, Vanessa Potkin, who's the um, post-conviction director at the Innocence Project and has been responsible for getting maybe 35 people out of jail that were wrongfully convicted. And she said, this is a great idea. This study has come out that 4% of people on death row are actually innocent. So, you know, given that there's 3000 right now, that could be 120 people scheduled to be executed that are innocent. So we started thinking about this. We ultimately brought it to um, a production company through our networking. And we did something called a sizzle, and then it caught the attention of Viola Davis, who has her own production company. And her production company helped us develop it and helped us make it a lot better than, than we would, you know, ultimately 
make it. And it became a, a limited uh, docuseries on ABC. So I would have never, if I had been told, okay, to go do that, it would have been intimidating, but it happened organically. It happened as a seed of thought, you know, with an extension, with you say it out into the universe, you talk to other people about it. And it was really in a odd way, very easy. Mm -hmm. And what happened after that? Um, the greatest thing for me about what happened after that, I mean, the whole experience was incredible. I got to work with really, really hardworking, intelligent, brilliant producers, research assistants. We selected two cases that we thought deserved a few episodes each to tell the uh, individual story. One was already a little bit more high profile. The other one had never had an article written about him. He was not mm -hmm. a household name. No one knew about him. His name is Julius Jones. And he was an all-star athlete, freshman in college on um, an academic scholarship, had lovely parents, a wonderful sister and brother. And I believe that he was wrongfully convicted of the murder of an innocent father during a carjacking. I don't think he was the right man. I think he was set up. Um, and the evidence overwhelmingly points to that as well. But as a result of the three episodes that we were able to create together, um, Kim Kardashian saw it, John Legend saw it, um, politicians, the head of the Black Caucus, and it started generating so much national attention and people like cared, they cared about this man. And now you have, you know, the quarterback of the Cowboys, you have Dak Prescott, you have Blake Griffin, all advocating for him on their megaphones and really generating this great publicity and energy. And for me, the most beautiful thing about that is he's no longer forgotten alone. He's done 21 years on death row, which is ultimately like solitary confinement, thinking that at any time his execution could be scheduled. And his family is no longer alone. They have the support of, of millions of people. And for me, that was the best thing about it. Um, it aired obviously on ABC, I think in 2017, and it did really well. We were very proud of the product um, and I'm grateful. And uh, has anything happened? Well, there was a lot of, right now, um, he his his case went to the Supreme Court uh, mm. of America, and unfortunately, they decided not to hear um, a really uh, a, an issue that absolutely warrants the attention of the Supreme Court of the United States. Um, at least one juror, maybe more, um, called Julius the N word during deliberations, and. This was testified to by one of the jurors that served um, on his case. And you just, regardless of his guilt or innocence, you cannot execute a man. You cannot um, execute a man where race played such a blatant um, part of his conviction and of his death sentence. It's unacceptable mm. and Right now, he's his case is pending before the parole board, and people are reaching out to Governor Kevin Stitt and saying, "Please um, have mercy, look into this case, and give him clemency, parole mm -hmm. him, release him." We will keep him in our prayers. Absolutely, and he's got two amazing lawyers that are working tires tirelessly on his case and I and I hope they make some headway on the investigation. Mm -hmm. How about Aida, like we take a minute and just say a silent prayer for everyone, including the gentleman. Thank you for sharing that. And listeners, one of the key things that's 
happening right now is that there is so much division and that's the reason I'm bringing in hard conversations that we need to have. Let's bring love in each and every person's heart, including forgiveness and compassion. What has happened with social media is that empathy has walked out from a lot of people's hearts. So let's bring some compassion in. I know you've joined us. And just by the fact that you're here, I depend on you to share the message of love and compassion because there's nothing more powerful in the world than love and compassion. So Aida, talking about your show, you know, you shared about a couple of cases. Did you continue with it or how did that come about with your own practice? Um, so this show was a limited docuseries, so it was only option for the seven episodes that we had. Um, in the meantime, I continue to work hard um, to fight for the underrepresented and for people that are terrified and have been charged with a crime. Um, you know, as you said, Divya, empathy is one of the most critical things in life. If, if you can't, not if you can't find empathy, we should all do our best to understand one another and see where other people are coming from, right? I love to listen to other people. People love being listened to. You know, sometimes you're in an argument, the argument's not necessary. That person may just wanna be listened to. And with my work, it is very important to be a good listener and to let the client finish his sentence and sometimes go off on their tangent so you can really discover what's going on in his or her life what led him to where he is right now? Um, why is he feeling this way? Why did he either use poor judgment or find himself in a situation he shouldn't have been in? Um, and from there, we, we try, obviously there are clients, so they get to make decisions about whether to go to trial or whether to plead guilty, but we try to get the best possible outcome for his or her life. Um, and it's, it's a tough job, mm -hmm. believe it or not, we laugh a lot. Um, we have a very strong bond. I'm, I'm a partner of Barkhead Epstein, Karen Aldea and Laturco. And every single one of the partners is, has a unique set of skills. Um, and we just, you know, feel like we're, we're, we're at war together and we try to keep each other upbeat and laugh and tell stories and engage in dialogue and keep moving along. Mm -hmm. So can you share a couple of stories where people were released after you took their case? I mean, after the wrongful convictions? Well, um, I'll tell you one of um, one of my one of my favorite things to do is um, put clients into the grand jury. Now, I would never put a client into the grand jury that shouldn't go into the grand jury, but in, um, in New York State, in order for the prosecutor to go forward on a felony as opposed to a more minor offense, they have to present evidence in front of uh, what's called the grand jury. And it's just a, a, a you know 12 plus people that hear the evidence. It's not proof beyond a reasonable doubt, it's just you know, more likely than not that the person did it. And um, when that process happens, it's a secret proceeding. And the accused has a right to testify on his own behalf in the grand jury or, um, or say, no, I'm going to plead my Fifth Amendment right. And I'm not going to say anything right now. I'm going to see what discovery you have. I'm going to see the witnesses that you called. And I'll save my testimony potentially for trial. And so very, very few people testify in the grand jury. And um, the, the, the line that you overhear a lot in law school is that a grand jury would indict a ham sandwich, right? So you may win at trial, but it's, it's a very low standard for the prosecutor to present their case and get the amount of votes they need to go forward. Um, mm -hmm. We have had tremendous success with the right cases of putting the clients in at the grand jury level and preparing them for their testimony. 
going over their story, uh, investigating it before, because we want to make sure that um, the person is telling us all that we should know. And um, the beauty about that is if the grand jurors believe your client, believe a story, and you can try to proffer other evidence, they'll dismiss it outright. And then that saves that individual potentially a year to two years to three years of going back and forth to court with your future remaining completely uncertain. So um, we, we had, I had a tremendous amount of success in Brooklyn in that regard. And uh, we've had some great success in Nassau County as well and in, in other counties. And that just, it's an amazing thing to tell the client, it's over. I know the case started a few you know, days ago, but you did a great job. The grand jurors believed you and dismissed and sealed, you don't have this hanging over your head anymore. Mm -hmm. So I received a couple of questions probably from some of the folks that I know and they have asking questions. They did not share it in the chat. So one of the questions they're asking is that, are you okay to be in a tough seat, in a hot seat? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, lawyers do have a bad rap. And, and everybody knows it. So the question is, how do you know that you're not defending someone who has done what they're being convicted for? So my answer to that is you don't sign up to be a defender to only represent innocent people. Mm -hmm. And it's sometimes the cases involving guilty clients that maybe the police had no right to stop. So maybe it was a bad search. Maybe a police officer said, uh, that person looks poor. They're not going to complain. I'm going to pull them over and I'm going to search their car. And that's a violation of your Fourth Amendment right. So you might fight that because you say, all right, the person might be factually guilty of having a weapon. Um, but the police officer had no right to stop him. And by creating good law, you help innocent people going forward. The reality is, is that people are more complicated than the charges that they have. 98% of cases or 97% of cases result in guilty pleas. So I'm often tasked with the responsibility of saying to a client, look, if you go to trial and you lose, you could get 25 years. But based on the fact that you made a mistake and we obtained all these amazing character references and that you've been in rehab and um, you know that there's some, some difficult areas of law that don't make it a slam dunk for the prosecutor, they're willing to offer you seven years. You know, seven years is tough. You know, it'll be tough for your family, but you'll get out and you'll be able to make a life and you'll be rehabilitated or, you know, assuming jail is successful at that. And so you're ultimately giving a person a second chance, right? As opposed to people have this vision that every defense lawyer represents a guilty person and goes to trial and wins and the person's walking on the street. That's generally not the case. A lot of our work is about mitigation, is about saying this, you know, 19 year old kid made a terrible mistake. Oh, by the way, he's bipolar. Oh, by the way, he doesn't have medical insurance. Um, this happened to him when he was younger. This is why he shouldn't go to jail for the rest of his life. And to me, that's honorable. And if you positive difference in that person's life and save them time that really they don't need to make in order to be um, rehabilitated or in order for the world to have retribution, then you're doing the right thing and you're giving that person a chance. We have more people incarcerated in the United States than in any other country per capita. I'm not sure it's necessary to sentence people to the amount of time that, you know, allows in terms of maximum sentences. Mm -hmm. I have a couple more questions. So one of the question is that I'm going to, it's, it's a long, <laughs> that on one hand, cops are putting their lives online to keep general public safe. So how do you determine who is 
the right person to defend? Um, well, for, well, now that I'm in private practice, often a client will come to us and seek out our expertise, either on a recommendation or they've read about us, so they want us to represent them. And we don't, um, we generally don't, you know, discriminate. We say this is everyone's entitled constitutionally to a defense attorney, everybody. And so we've got a job to do. It's kind of like a Hippocratic oath that a doctor takes. The doctor doesn't say, am I gonna save this person in the ER? Is he a good person or not? He just does his job. And that's the job that you know I ultimately swore to do. Um, but there are a lot of really amazing, I'm not anti-law enforcement. There are some very, very good uh, police officers out there. And, and there are some that aren't bad people, but did the wrong thing. Um, mm -hmm. And there's some bad eggs everywhere, right? So right. for for me, it's it's giving counsel to the client. So maybe I'll have a detective on his case that I've been before, and I'll say, by the way, this detective does really well in front of juries. Juries really like him. So it's going to be very hard to defeat what he's saying unless we have other proof. Lead subpoena video footage, you know, to see if it corroborates what you're telling me. Um, are there any witnesses that we can find? Uh, is there cell site tower data that puts you somewhere else, right? So it's not, being a lawyer isn't about um, pulling a rabbit out of a hat. It's about <laughs> making judgment calls. Um, and believe me, sometimes we do pull rabbits out of hats, right? But it's about making judgment calls um, based on our experience and areas of expertise. Uh, we can never promise someone they're gonna win. You know, clients often say, what are the what are the chances like 50, 50, 40, 60? And there's no mathematical equation that you can give someone. Um, well, uh, one more question that has come up uh, is that do you take only paid clients or do you also serve pro bono? We serve pro bono. Um, and a lot of our pro bono work um, comes often in the form of wrongful conviction cases. Mm -hmm. uh, we get many letters from upstate prisons uh, saying, my name is so-and-so, please take a few moments to read my letter. This is um, information about my case. Um, you know, please look it up and consider having me as a client. And we recently did that um, with actually one of our paralegals was exonerated. So he did time, um, about 19 years for a crime he didn't commit. And while he was incarcerated, he met um, Samuel Brownridge, who he believed in his innocence. And when he, our paralegal was exonerated before he became our paralegal, um, mm -hmm. he said, I'm not gonna forget about you, Sam. And he didn't, and he advocated for our law firm to take the case on. Um, and we did, and we have an incredible um, appeals partner, Donna Aldea. She's the best in the state, I'm willing to say in the country. Of course, I haven't met or read every every appellate lawyer's uh, briefs in the country, but she's incredibly inspiring, very smart, an incredible writer, uh, an incredible speaker. And she, you know, wasn't convinced right away that we'd be able to win. Um, mm -hmm. But we took the case and the more she looked into it uh, with the help of our paralegal who did a, a amazing job on this case um, and our partner, Bruce Barquette, who said, I'm not the best person for the job, but I'm deciding we're absolutely taking this case. I think this guy is innocent. And then as a result, we were able to get him exonerated. We don't um, only take wrongful conviction cases um, mm -hmm. pro bono, but I'll probably get in trouble if I advertise too much about how, how many pro bono <laughs> cases we do. <gasps> Absolutely, no. And to keep the doors open, you got to have paid clients too. So it's, it's a balance and it's great that you are also serving pro bono clients. And thank you for being open to answering questions. And one last question somebody has sent is that you, you have seen things on both sides. One of the key things is how do you see yourself? 
So their question is that at the end of the day, when you look yourself in the mirror before going to bed, when you brush your teeth, how do you feel? Um, I think that for me, I mean, we're talking about careers, but for me, one of the most important things in life is your loved ones. I'm very close to my parents, to my grandparents, my siblings, my friends. And I think often my job teaches me about whether or not, you know, I'm handling something well because it's high stress sometimes. You get short, sometimes you get in arguments with clients or your coworkers. And I, I, I go to sleep happy. I'm proud of who I've become, but I'm constantly trying to be a better person. And I'm always looking out for ways that I can um, serve others and be better, right? Sometimes you get negative energy or hostility or anger towards someone. And whenever I feel that way, I don't like it. Um, it doesn't make me feel like a good person, but um, mm -hmm. we're not perfect. We're all human beings. And I just keep hoping that I'll continue to strive to be the best that I can be. Well, that's pretty deep and that's great. And what you talk about is human beings are not perfect. I don't know about anybody out there, but I know that I am not perfect. <laughs> and if you're perfect, hey, you know, all the more power to you. But I know that perfect gets in the way of progress. And to me, if you're open and if you know your flaws, you know what your weaknesses are. And the intention is to serve. There's nothing more better charter to live your life than having the intention to serve. So that said, you mentioned that you know there is influx of negativity and there is there are times when you may be in conflict with your client or with your coworkers. How do you deal with that? How do I and I'm sorry you cut off a little bit. How do sure. you get how do you deal your with your stress and with negativity in your life? <sighs> you know. I like to say that God created every emotion for a reason. And so if I'm depressed, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that's actually um, your body trying to tell you something. Personally, when I overthink it and the wheels get turning in my brain, I don't do myself a service. Um, your brain, in my view, is a muscle. And if you overwork it, it's not going to come up with creative solutions to your problems. So whenever I'm feeling stressed or depressed or anxious, rather than obsess on how I can fix it, I say, all right, I'm gonna drink less wine. I'm gonna go for a run. I'm gonna go for a walk. Tonight I wanna drink this kind of tea. Uh, maybe I'll write 10 things down in a journal and I just take it easy. And I try not to stress out about the stress that I'm going through. Um, and I, I find when you just sort of shift your habits and you don't overthink the, the deepness of where the problem is coming from, you get less tired, you're stronger, and then you're better able to deal with it. I also say when you're really, really down, try to just help another person. And that might be calling up a friend on the phone and say, hey, how are you, how are you doing? And I feel selfish saying this, but helping others makes me feel better. Right. So it gives me strength. I'm happy to do that for somebody else. It gives me a sense of um, purpose. And that's what we all really need. Right. A sense of purpose gives us the will to live and keep on going and um, makes us inspired. But to me, that's that's the simple solution. Go go make a phone call to someone who needs it and go running. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Exercise will definitely do that. And as a matter of fact, one of the leading neuroscientists, Richard, I don't remember his last name, has very distinctly shown us that there are four different circuits in the brain. And one circuit is a circuit where it is designed to help others. It's designed for compassion and doing good for others. And that's the reason we feel good about it. So you're not selfish, all of us, 
when we talk about altru altruism, it's more so like, you know, brains are designed to help us and at the same time help others. So when we are helping others, we are benefiting others. It's a very mutually win-win situation and a good way to go and exercise. Absolutely. The facts are very, very clear on that. So if you were to give one thing to our listeners as they, as we wrap up the show, what might that be? If I were to say, I'm sorry, say it again. If, if you were to just share one final thought, one final piece of um, insight. I, I, I think that, um, you know, this is very cliche, but we should all leave our phones at home and go for walks. <laughs> and I mean, it's, it's, I, I, I grew up so lucky because we didn't have social media. We didn't have cell phones. I actually just played in the yard with other kids and got to experience things with my eyes um, that weren't inside of a computer. And I think it's important for, you know, not to obsess over all the division, but go out of your way to make your world feel like one filled with love, right? So I'll reach out to my grandmother and have a funny conversation with her and laugh. You know, we have to laugh. And I think that if you do a little less phone, a little less news, a little more love to those that, you know, are within reach, um, then it's, it's a pretty good recipe for a happy life. Absolutely, Aida. Thank you for your parting thought. Very thoughtful and very insightful. It was good to have you on the show. It was so wonderful to be here. And I loved your viewers' questions. They were good. I got put on the hot seat, but that's good. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes, you know, our listeners are who make this show possible. And of course, Rebel makes it possible. And it's good that they ask us tough questions because when they ask us tough questions, that's how they keep us honest. And thank you, for folks. I appreciate, you know, I've got a few listeners who have connected with me. And sometimes it was tough that you reached out to me on my phone. I appreciate you asking the questions. And thank you. Thank you for joining us. And as we talked, be well, be brilliant, and step into your power. And thank you, Rebel, for making this show possible. Until next Monday, take care. Thank you for being part of Beyond Confidence with your host, Divya Park. We hope you have learned more about how to start living the life you want. Each week on Beyond Confidence, you hear stories of real people who have experienced growth by overcoming their fears and building meaningful relationships. During Beyond Confidence, Divya Park shares what happened to her when she stepped out of her comfort zone to work directly with people across the globe. She not only coaches people how to form heart connections, but also transform relationships to mutually beneficial partnerships as they strive to live the life they want. If you are ready to live the life you want and leverage your strengths, learn more at www.divyapark.com. And you can connect with Divya at contact at divyapark.com. We look forward to you joining us next week, Monday, 8 p.m. Eastern Time.